And how do you see the current phase, the five-year monitoring exercise? So I think that's really in the DNA of the Comframe project, and that's also clear for the ICS, is really to build this common language. So supervisors at the same table discussing uh, the situation of a particularly internationally active insurance groups, they have this common language. The ultimate goal of this project uh, is to have a single ICS that includes a common methodology by which one ICS achieves comparable, which in our language means substantially the same outcomes across jurisdiction. We have um, a global insurance industry in Europe, uh, active in different markets, so it's, uh, and competing with other uh, globally active uh, insurance group from coming from other jurisdictions. So it makes a lot of sense to have as Roman said, a, a common language that allows supervisors to speak to each other. We would like to see as a, a final uh, outcome of all this, uh, a truly global standard. We are, of course, uh, very much supportive of the developments that are taking place internationally. In terms of expectations from AOPA, of course, as you all know, we have been um, engaging since the first moment on the ICS development and, and we fundamentally believe that um, let's say the core characteristics that we have currently in, in the Solvency 2 framework are sound and should, should be captured also in an international framework. It's a very, I think, meaningful work plan that's been laid out by the IAS and has several important dimensions to it. I think it's important that it's evidence-based, and I think it, it's, there's every indication that it's going to be an evidence-based process if you look across uh, impact testing, uh, further calibration work, um, as well as the, uh, the comparability work. Uh, and I think that's all, that's all very important. I think, though, there's a distinction between being evidence-based and being purely uh, data-driven. AXA uh, X and WAS, um, I don't know exactly if I need to use the uh, ESO or WAS, uh, supporting the initial commitment uh, to develop uh, a single high quality and robust insurance standard um, with the idea to be applied uh, across uh, all uh, jurisdictions, in fact. The initial idea uh, that we were supporting for the ICS being a common standard uh, was really with the uh, the, uh, the target uh, to uh, enhance the global level of playing field. Our feeling, uh, in fact, after the Abu Dhabi agreement was that there was a clear shift uh, in the project, uh, which started at a certain point in time, really from the idea to develop a, a common international standard, um, and it shifted towards uh, creating um, what I call an international framework uh, for uh, equivalent assessment. We participated uh, to the last part of the field testing, and we have observed indeed some, I would say, differences between our current uh, Solvency 2 framework and what we see in the ICS framework. And this is allows us indeed as also an international player seeing potential for, for example, business which we have outside of the EEA area. I don't see it as convergent, but at least as a, a common understanding of, uh, of the risk assessment. Uh, and, and, and let's say this uh, ICS framework allows us to reflect in an easier way uh, these non-controlled uh, participation, which for us as a more decentralized group than, for example, our other colleagues uh, on, on the discussion, uh, to integrate these in our uh, risk assessment. How do you see the process of convergence and, and how do you view the aggregation method within the context of the ICS monitoring phase? Uh, so there's clearly a link uh, between this development of the aggregation method and, uh, and the ICS in this sense. The IIS has recognized and wants to be in a position uh, by the end of the monitoring period uh, to assess whether it delivers uh, it provides comparable outcome uh, to the ICS. The NAAC formally adopted uh, the, what's called the group capital calculation or the U.S. version of the aggregation method. So 
Uh, that will now go into uh, the legislative sessions, uh, which will have a chance to, at a state level, uh, adopt it as part of the Insurance Holding Company uh, Model Act. Uh, this adoption of GCC doesn't mean that the work is going to stop. So there's going to be continued uh, testing next year. It wasn't really clear from the beginning what um, this aggregation method was uh, about in the first place. But that concept that still needs to be developed uh, would be subject to this, indeed, uh, comparisons exercise, which we have started uh, with uh, the adoption of um, compar comparison criteria. Uh, we are still have questions about this, this concept of scholars, to be, to be fair. How does the more limited participation in the set of institutions that are participating in the monitoring potentially impact the quality of the ICS? The purpose of the ICS is to be a, a, prescribed, a group prescribed capital standard for internationally active insurance groups. So it's really for these groups that do operate, with, we have cross-border operations. I think the question about your domestic regime is a little bit of a different one. How might you deal with this aggregation approach with Insolvency 2 uh, going forward? So the reference point should be the ICS, but there's only one uh, ICS. No, I think the flexibility offered with the COVID reality was actually uh, beneficial for us. So normally in the period at the start of the year, we would receive the technical specification, start the collection of data from the local entities, receive it before we enter in our second quarter closing, send it to our different boards and then hand it over to our local supervisor for, let's say, interaction with the International Association of Supervisors. From a Japan point of view, um, we are already uh, used to uh, uh, those kind of risk assessment through the, the Solvency 2 framework. Uh, the ICS is, is for uh, IAIG, so for groups, and not uh, for uh, domestic application. And I, I, I'm always struck by that because uh, uh, insurance groups, uh, and of course we have uh, different type of activities, we have an asset management activity too, but the insurance group are made up by entities, local entities, and uh, they are competing essentially locally because the competition is on the market. This question of, uh, of impacts, um, I think the short answer is we don't know at this stage. You want to make sure that the ICS or that any capital regime is sufficiently sensitive to secular trends or secular changes over time in either financial markets or in core insurance risks. There's been a question on the relationship between the ICS implementation and any revisions to Solvency 2. Timings now don't work particularly well, um, but you also acknowledge that the, you know, the any implementation of the ICS at the end of the five-year period can't be a full copycat of Solvency 2. The ICS work is, is not done yet. I think on that I, I would maybe disagree slightly because we published ICS 2.0, but now we have the, the monitoring period, which is very important. Participation is, is crucial. I mean, ideally, I would say from, from the beginning, because, um, of course, we will be looking at 2019 data as a kind of a baseline, uh, how we assess then the, the behavior of the ICS. So I think from IOPA, one point that has always been made clear from our side, maybe going a bit to, to Patricia's point, is that we would, even if the ICS is a group standard, we would, of course, not, not favor a solution in the end where we have uh, multiple standards being applied in Europe at solo and group level. We do not expect that uh, uh, major changes will be needed in, in, in the contrary. Uh, but uh, at this stage, it's premature. I would indeed hope that the two frameworks, even if their methodology might not be completely aligned, which we nevertheless would hope as an insurer to avoid multiple frameworks, but at least they give the same message. Huh? If we manage our company, we have a prudential framework and that the same, let's say, communication can be taken from the two frameworks. For us, the Solvency 2 review uh, is going on now, right now. Uh, it's a very important step uh, to us, uh, and uh, uh, we really will engage uh, a, a lot of uh, 
work uh, uh, around the, that review. How do you see the work of the IAS and the um, ICS shaping you know, international understanding, in particular in the EU-US context? We, of course, have a, a close uh, cooperation and, and dialogue with, uh, with our US uh, counterparts, I think, already since many years. Of course, what we learn through the EU-US uh, cooperation be it uh, regulatory or at supervisory level in, in concrete uh, groups and then colleges, that will all, of course, also benefit the IAS uh, exchanges. But um, I think we, we need to, to make a bit uh, the, 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 the distinction there because, of course, the ICS is, is not just about EU and US uh, coming to an agreement. It's true that there's more um, than, the, let's say, the narrow... Uh, uh, prudential capital requirements uh, uh, part of the work taking place in the uh, in the context of the uh, I AIS, of course. To put the ICS itself in a in a broader context, that I would like to flag and uh, this uh, strong involvement uh, from our members from other continents like Asia, like Oceania, like like Africa, and that's 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 a very important point. I mean, we have seen that with the COVID nineteen, which has been really a global situation. And that makes a lot of value in international cooperation.